Okay, we got 2 Thessalonians, the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, so they're going to talk about it more here, and our being gathered to him, gathered up to him at the rapture. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled. Do not become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us. This is one of the dangers of doing Bible studies. I thought I thought long and hard before I did it, actually. Because people will take what you say and turn it into something else. Now, I'm talking about good people. They don't mean to do it. They don't mean you any harm, no. But, you know, the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. We live in a society where everything is over-communicated by 100,000 times, <laughs> 10,000 times. Every single subject is analyzed, in my opinion, down to the stupidity of the subject. I mean, you, you literally take the subject and just keep beating it. It's like the fake flour and bread today. They take the wheat flour, then they send it through a manufacturing plant and crush it down into oblivion. Then they send it through another thing and bleach it all. And then they do like five other things to the flour, and then they make your bread after the flour has been ruined. You wonder why bread doesn't taste like your mom's homemade bread or your grandma's homemade bread, you know, 50 years ago? So I'm 60 years old. Do you know what it was like when my when I tasted my grandma's homemade banana nut bread in 1970? Oh my gosh, it was heaven. You can't even find anything like that today unless, you know, you spend $15, $20 for a loaf. So look what it says here. Do not be alarmed... By the teaching allegedly from us. You see, people are going around and using Paul's words to attack him. See, this is what the enemy does. Now, pay very close attention to this next part. What did the enemy say to Eve in the Garden of Eden? She was looking at the tree, the forbidden tree. Do not eat the tree of the fruit from the tree in the center of the garden. So she was looking at it. Now, what did we read elsewhere? Do not look, do not touch, do not think about it. Get away from these sinful things. But she was looking at it. And Adam was not around at the time. He was walking around and she was looking. What did the devil say? The serpent, the crafty one. The one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's been a liar from the beginning, according to Jesus Christ. What did he say to Eve? Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did? He's going to ask her a question. You don't want the devil asking you questions. You don't want to listen to any questions he's going to ask you. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Question mark. Ah, he tricked her. Was more crafty, tricky than any of the... He tricked her. Did God really say you should not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, that's not what God says. He didn't bring up the tree in the center of the garden. I wonder if he was afraid of God's wrath. The woman said to the serpent, You may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. 
we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. What does the devil say? You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will lack. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, she should have ran away immediately and never spoke to him. What does Paul say back in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us. The false teachings from other people. You see, the same devil that talked to, the same devil that spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden is the exact same devil. He's still alive. God created him. He cannot die. He will be thrown into the um, lake of burning sulfur for all eternity. Um, I think it's two angels will be given power over him to chain and bind him with great chains for all eternity. Whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Oh boy, this is good. They are attacking Paul on every side. Word of mouth, by prophecy, and by a letters. You see, because Paul wrote letters. That's what we're reading here, what God told him to write. That the day of the Lord has already come. Okay, so you can see the devil talking to these false people and saying to them, just like he did Eve in the Garden of Eden, what are you waiting for? And instead of saying nothing and walking away, they said, we are waiting for the return and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And somehow, either by devil or by evil, um, by demon or evilness, someone convinced them that that is not going to happen. The day of the Lord has already come. The rapture has already happened. And then you got people today saying there's never going to be a rapture. There's no hell. There's no heaven. It's just earth. And there's no God. You could go as far as that. It's just UFOs from other planets. They're chasing Adam and Eve around to get them to sin. Get them on the wide road to destruction. They're chasing... Paul around 2,000, almost 30 years ago, trying to destroy what God is telling him. And they're chasing you, a believing Christian, around today to get control of the thoughts in your mind to where you start doubting, you will start doubting what the Lord Jesus Christ says. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, we go to end prophecy here. Oh, this is some good stuff. Today. This chapter is a big, huge, awesome chapter. The lawless one will be revealed at the three and a half year mark of the seven years of tribulation. He will set himself up in the temple of the Lord. The abomination that causes desolation. Most people don't know what the abomination that causes desolation is, so I will teach you right now what it is. It's an abomination slash break this saying in half and look at it on both sides. Abomination slash that causes desolation. The, the very first part is the abomination. The second part is the causes desolation. The first part, the word abomination, it's an abomination 
when the devil says, I am God, he's going to go into the temple of the, you know, the Jews are going to rebuild the temple with the um, rest of the world, actually, or the Palestines. They're going to, you know, peace, kumbaya, everything's great. And when he gets them to do that, the devil goes in and reveals himself and says, I am God. That's an abomination against God to claim you are God. Okay. Let's go back to Jesus Christ, because that's really what we're talking about every single time we do a Bible study. Jesus Christ claimed to be God. So the devil is going to claim to be God. And it's an abomination. But when Jesus Christ claimed to be equal to the Father, equal to God... The fullness of God himself, no one said it was an abomination. No one said it was wrong. They picked up stones and tried to kill him because they knew he had, in their eyes, he was committing the ultimate sin, Jesus claiming to be God. But we know Jesus is God. That's why they were not able to do anything to him. So you go back and tell the, so let's, what's it say here again? The Lord has already come. That is false. Do not let anyone re deceive you until that day the rebellion occurs. The man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Why does it call him a man? Because the devil has two or three men that he lets, like the first guy that's going to come on the scene in the world after the rapture is going to be like a man. And, and the devil's going to put all his power into this man so he can perform all these miraculous things. But they won't see the devil yet. The man of lawlessness is not a man. It is the devil. And he goes into the temple in Jerusalem, in the three and a half year mark, he says, I am God. Boom. Okay, slash. The And then God opens the eyes of the Jews immediately. Right now, they their eyes are somewhat closed for the last 2,030 years. Why? Because when Jesus rode in on a donkey... The Jews did not recognize the time of the Lord's, their Savior's coming. Like he says, I long to gather you as a, um, a mother hen gathers her chicks under my wing. They didn't recognize their, they, they have been under a, um, a shutting of the eyes, so to speak, by God himself for the last 2,000 years. Okay. As soon as the devil says, I am God, that's the abomination. And as soon as the, I don't know, five minutes later, the Lord's going to open their eyes of all the Jews and they are going to see that this is not God. This is the devil. They are being tricked. And that's what's going to cause desolation, desolation of Jerusalem. There's a verse and Jesus talks about prophecy. When you um, see the abomination that causes desolation, do not, you know the verse, do not even go down into your house to grab your coat or it'll be too late for you. As soon as you, halfway through the tribulation, you hear the devil claim to be God, it says immediately flee to the mountains in Judea, flee. How, and the, how severe it will be for people during that time. Never, it says, no punishment like this has ever occurred in the history of the world. Now, check it out. I mean, they're saying these people are going to suffer more than um, the great flood. Because if you're pregnant, you don't have clothes, food, water. You're in the mountains. It's, you know, 20 below zero. You have no shelter. Oh, it's going to be horrible. There's going to be, and that is when 
the first bowl of wrath pours out right after that. God is pouring out the bowls of wrath down on the man of lawlessness, the one who claimed to be God. But he's pouring it on the whole earth. I just want to give you a little, little bit of insight there. The man doomed to destruction. Yes, and when Jesus comes back, he will throw that man into the lake of burning sulfur for a thousand years. But then at the end of the thousand years, he is let loose for a short time to see who he can deceive. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. Okay, right there. Everything that is called God or is worshipped. So, what did Jesus say? Boy, we're bouncing around a lot here. This is one of the benefits of knowing a most of the entire Bible. Yeah, I've been reading the Bible for over 30 years, and I still don't know. I can't remember all the, um, you know, like I said, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a minister. I'm not a Bible teacher, per se. I can't remember the names, and I don't know who they were and all that stuff like that. Okay. He will ex he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship. So Jesus said after the 40 days of fasting, when the devil came and said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, it is written, worship God and God only. So what does it say here the devil's going to do? He is first going to oppose everything that is called God or worshiped for God. Uh, <laughs> now he is being revealed, my friends. The true him is coming out. He wants to be God since the beginning. He was God's um, greatest creation, which does not include Jesus. The Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses, they take that verse that the devil was God's greatest creation and they think that um, the devil and Jesus are equal brothers. No. It doesn't say greatest creation. It says most beautiful created angel and wisest. No, no. You have to remember, all things were created through Jesus, which makes Jesus above all things. So Jesus is... God above, Jesus the creator, is above the devil who was created. The devil is not a creator. The devil is a created being just like you and I are. But at some point, the devil got full of pride and said, I want to be God. I want people to worship me. And so he got one third of the angels to come and start a war in heaven. We don't know that much about it, actually. And in the blink of an eye, like lightning flashes from the west to the east, boom. The devil and the, the third of the angels were cast onto the earth. And they've been here ever since. They're here now. They're still here. They're still going around trying to screw up your life. And that is why you need Jesus Christ like a dome of protection. Okay. He's going to oppose everything that is God and everything that is worship. Then he is going to exalt himself over everything that is called God and is worshiped. He's going to exalt, say, I am God, just like he tried to do in heaven. It didn't work out for him then. It's not going to work out for him now. So that he sets himself up so that the, he, the devil, sets himself up in God's temple. I just explained all that to you. Proclaiming himself to be God. He's going to proclaim himself to be God, the abomination that causes desolation. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. 
You see, as soon as we're raptured, the seven-year tribulation starts. The first three and a half years is a time of false, F-A-L-S-E, false peace. There, there's no bulls going down. There's no wars on earth. The, the entire earth comes together to get a, a symbol on their hand or forehead to buy or sell. Now, I want to say for sure that the rapture could actually... I mean, the symbol on the hand or forehead to buy or sell, that could occur before the rapture. Some of these wars could most likely occur before the rapture. You see, people tend to lump all of these things together, but you got to kind of separate them out. And now we know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Well, the proper time is three and a half years after he deceived the world for three years of false peace. And everybody, and he's going to solve all the world's problems. Put the one United Nations, the one world government, it's all going to be one money, one world, probably computerized money. On one central bank, all the governments of the world, there won't be a president of the United States during that time, or there won't be a leader in Russia or China. They will all start to follow this false man because he's so convincing. You have to understand, two billion people, up to two billion people just were raptured. So the world is going to be looking for a solution. Where did those people go? Because if you don't believe in God, you don't believe they went with God. You notice how the UFOs are coming up now? All the UFOs are coming up. Do you notice how the UFOs are starting to come up? That is going to be one of the explanations about the rapture that the UFOs came and took us away. Well, why would, why did they only take away Christians? Well, because those Christians are troublemakers, don't you know? <laughs> we got rid of all the Christians, the troublemakers, the ones causing all the problems on the earth. Now we can have a peaceful earth. And the, the UFO aliens did us a favor by taking these Christians to another planet. I'm telling you, it's going to be all over the news and everything. Just imagine... A hundred news stations worldwide trying to figure out what happened to us. These stories are going to, you think I'm sounding crazy, but I'm not. Just imagine the news media getting a hold of this rapture thing and completely mangling it and turning it upside down and backwards and sideways and, and then drowning it. I mean, they're going to screw the whole thing up. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Aha! You say, well, we know there's lawlessness in, in, in the world. Crime, hate, abortion, um, murder, idolatry. Of course, idolatry is not against the law, but it is a lawless act. Um, sex acts, pornography, drugs. I mean, here in Oregon, they just approved psychedelic mushrooms for um, therapy. It's now legal in the state of Oregon to take psychedelic mushrooms to get rid of your stress. Why would they, why would they want you to start taking all these drugs here in the last days? I think you can figure that out. You're pretty smart. The power of lawlessness. It doesn't say the lawless one. The power of lawlessness. What do you think the third of those fallen angels are doing today? They're all demons now, but what do you think a third of the fallen angels are doing today? They're going around and creating as much trouble as they can against God. Now, let me tell you why. Because the devil and a third of those angels, they only have one hope and one hope only. And that is to kill God himself and then completely take over. They just don't understand that if they killed God, then they wouldn't exist and nothing else would exist. They do not exist independently 
well, let me put it this way. Life itself, the spirit, the brain, the heart pumping, spiritual beings cannot exist outside of God's power. But for now, he's allowing them to exist. They're never going to repent. People say, well, why doesn't the devil just repent and the third of the angels say they're sorry and go back to heaven? Nope. They committed the act that cannot be forgiven against the Holy Spirit, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They claim themselves to be God. That's why I say Jesus Christ also claimed himself to be God. So he either is God and everything in this book is true, or he is the biggest crazy person in the world and billions of people have been following a crazy person. And six billion people will say, yeah, yeah, that's the answer. Two billion, two billion idiots are following Christianity. But I'm telling you, why are they deceived? Why is six billion people on the earth deceived? Now, hang on. This is very important. The secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Right now, today, every day you wake up, lawlessness is at work in every single street corner in the entire world. That is why God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit tell you constantly, whatever you do, be holy and live holy lives like God, Jesus and even though we're we're living these holy lives, we're trying to, in this lawless, lawlessness world, one day, and that causes suffering in our life. I don't care how nice you are to some people. They don't believe in God and they're not going to like you. They hate your guts no matter how nice. But you keep being like Jesus and then in heaven we will be rewarded. But I'm telling you, you will be rewarded down here also. Okay, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till, T-I-L-L, -L, till he is taken out of the way. And then the, if you want to know more about this, go back to the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying the day before he was going to be crucified. Go back to the Garden of Gethsemane and read the three prayers Jesus said. He prayed for his himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for all future believers. And he said, I pray, Father, that you do not take them out of the world, but you protect them while they are in the world. He's talking about me and you as a believer. I pray you will protect them while they are in the world and God is faithful and has been holding back the lawless one, keeping him mostly away from the believing Christians. But if you're not a believing Christian and you're not under these blessings and prayers, you're pretty much on your own in this world. You're just wandering around in a lawless world that is corrupt and going to fall. And you could just turn a corner in this world and completely destroy your entire life without the protection of God, the Father, you know. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Now, first of all, do you know that nobody's ever seen the splendor of the coming of Jesus? Nobody, it's never been. Nobody's ever seen his full-on ultimate splendor. Now, he's going to overthrow the devil with the breath of his mouth. Now, to me, the breath means words. He's not going to actually breathe on him. No, he's going to use words. And he's going to, just like when he used words to create let there be light, and there was light. You know, let there be seas, and there was seas. Let, let the seas teem with living life, and it did. Let the stars, the sun, the moon, 
And it was so instantly. Well, that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. He's going to tell these two angels, bind the lawless one. I'm just paraphrasing. Bind him and throw him into the um, lake of burning sulfur for 1,000 years. And it'll be done immediately. Boom. See, that's why if you're a believer, don't ever give up. Because one single word from Jesus Christ and boom, your whole life can change for a hundred times for the better. He can pour down a blessing on you. You'll never be able to contain it. You'll just have to, <laughs> you'll just have to stand there and enjoy it. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroyed by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. Everything I just said, the devil, Satan, that's what I'm telling you. All of these things are happening alongside of like a mirror image of how Satan himself works. He, Satan cannot do good. Oh, he could probably cause a few good things to happen in your life to trick you. It reminds me of, um, I've heard preachers say this. It's the only reason I bring it up. A scorpion wanted to cross like this river in front of me here. A, a black scorpion. But scorpions can't swim across the river. Not that I know of. And there was a turtle and the, tur the scorpion said, let me go on your back so I can get across the river. The turtle says, no, you'll bite me. If I put you on my back, you'll reach around and bite me in the neck and kill me. The scorpion said, why would I do that? Then I myself would drown. So the turtle says, okay, hop on. And they're going across the river. They're going across the river. The scorpion bites him right in the back of the neck and kills him. And the turtle says, why did you do that? The scorpion said, because that's my nature. I'm a scorpion. You see, in accordance to the way the devil is, his nature always is to kill, steal, and destroy what God has created. Now, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't care about you or me. The devil doesn't care about the believers. He hates their guts. He doesn't care about you. This is not a battle between you and him. It's a battle between him and God. He is. He's not trying to overthrow you. Some guy that goes to work nine, nine to five and buy a big, huge truck payment. He doesn't care about your life. He's trying to overthrow God. He's trying to become God. This isn't a battle between believers and the devil. This is a battle between God and the devil. You are just a pawn in this battle. And, it, you know, you have to, um, you see, if you're allowing the devil, evil, sin, S-I-N, sin to Take part of your life, you're just being used as a pawn on a chessboard. It's the most useless piece, a pawn. But if you're following God's plan, you're not a pawn. You're very important to God. You're a believer. You're going to spend eternity shining like Jesus Christ himself. It says we will all shine like him. Accordance with how Satan works. I just wanted to touch on there. That's how he works. He's going to destroy you at some point is his goal. Only Jesus Christ can protect you. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Ah. He will do. During that um, three and a half years of false peace, he will perform signs and miracles and wonders. And people will say, we need to follow him. 
But why is he doing it? To serve the lie, L-I-E. That's what Jesus said. He's a liar from the beginning. And all the ways that wickedness deceives, wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish those going to hell. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Now, I got some Christians. I, I can't tell certain Christians that people are going to go to hell. They go, no, no, I don't want to hear it. Um, I can't think about it. God wishes for all to be saved. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible just said for all of those who are perishing. Well, we know the word perishing means eternity in hell. So if God here, Jesus, through Paul, 2 Thessalonians, is bringing up the fact that the majority, the overwhelming majority of the world is going to perish and be cast into hell, and it's happening every single day right now when they die. You cannot go against God's plan and say, I don't want to talk about hell. I, I've heard a, a, a female Christian um, once say to me, I only want to talk about the good things of God, the lovely things, you know. I only want to talk about um, the goodness of God. I don't want to talk about hell. Well, they're being deceived by the devil, you see. All the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Why do they perish? They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. What is the truth? You notice how they put that together, the truth and then salvation, be saved? The truth is Jesus Christ on the cross and then believe in that and so be saved. They refuse to believe in Jesus Christ on the cross. They say, no, 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 Jesus is not real. And without Jesus, you cannot go to heaven. And without Jesus, you will perish. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion. Wow, now this is going to blow your mind. So that they will believe the lie. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So now check this out. This is something about God that may you may or may not know. Most Christians do not know it because they do not read the Bible line by line. And then when you get to a line that blows your mind, you stop for 10 minutes and think about that one line over and over and over until the, the answer is revealed to you. Now, here's the, I'm going to reveal the answer to you, and it's, <laughs> you might not like it. You may look at God in a different light. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion. So, I heard a saying once, what does God do? And the answer was, anything he wants. God can do anything he wants. He is God. God doesn't need you. We need him. God does God could just create anything he wants, anywhere he wants at any time he wants. He told Moses, "Stand back. I'll destroy this entire generation of Jews that came out of Egypt and I'll start over." Time and space only exist because God said they should. Or they can, or they would right now. I'm telling you. So you say, why would God send? Now, I had to say that because you're asking yourself, why would God send non-believers a delusion? Well, he sent the Jews a delusion 2,030 years ago. They have been under a delusion, believing the lie. What is the lie? that Jesus Christ is not the Savior. Okay, now check it out. 
You know, you don't think about it. Yes, God loves everyone, and God wishes for them to be saved. But as of right now, these are enemies of God in a spiritual battle that has been going on since the Garden of Eden, about 6,000 years. See, this is mind-blowing stuff here. God, God in his holiness says, Believe upon my son and you shall be saved. And then he crucifies his son and spills his son's blood, raises him again on the third day, gives him all power and authority. And then he comes back and tells the same people. Believe upon my son, Jesus Christ, and you so shall be saved. And they say, no, we're not going to. He asks them again, no. Again, no. A hundred times he asks them, no. You know, I heard people tell me before, I've never heard from God. If I hear from God, then I'll, I'll think about believing in him. I say, you hear from God every single day in America. They go, you're crazy, Dave. I've never heard from guys say, you can't drive down the street without seeing 20 crosses on 20 churches in an average town. You can't turn on the radio without occasionally, by mistake, turning on Christian radio on your way to the rock and roll station. You can't turn on a TV today without seeing ads about um, Jesus Christ and Christianity. You cannot live through one Sunday in America without thinking about the hundred or the tens of mi uh, millions and millions of people that go to church every Sunday. You cannot get, you can't go through Christmas without thinking about Jesus. When you see Easter, you may be thinking about the Easter bunny and the colored eggs, but you can't go through Easter without hearing about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm saying every single person at a minimum has Jesus Christ thrown in their face at least once a week. You know, that's 50 times a year. Do you know if you live to be 50 years old, they've had Jesus. You go up to a 50 year old person and they say, I don't believe in that. I don't know nothing about it. No, everybody knows about Jesus Christ. Now, hang on. I'm making a point here. In 50 years, they've had Jesus Christ thrown in their face a minimum of 2,500 times, according to my example. So at some point in God's holy perfection and God's holy wisdom, perfect wisdom, see, this isn't between you and God. This is between God and them. At some point, God will send them a delusion and say, oh, you want you, you want to refuse my son? I'll, I'll, I'll delude you and let you believe in the lie and live your whole life in confusion. Do you know there's a verse in the Bible that says, God says, I give some men great wealth. Oh, if this doesn't make you shudder, S-H-U-T-T-E-R, shudder. I don't know what will. I give some men great wealth. They spend their entire lives getting rich, but I, God, do not let them enjoy any of it. What? You just They just spent 70 years collecting millions and millions of dollars, and God says, because they are not following my son, I never once let them enjoy any of it. They've never enjoyed a day in their life or any of this money. So, you know, you may have questions why God would send a delusion. Let's read it again. They refused to believe the truth. They perished because they lo loved. They refused to love the truth and so be saved. You know, right there, you're not supposed to just believe Jesus Christ, the truth. You're supposed to love Jesus and love the truth that he gives. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion, not just a delusion. You ever see anybody walking around, you like, that person looks all screwed up in life. And you're like, why are they, they got a job, they work where I work, they got a house, they got a wife, 
kids, but they always make mistakes. They're always having problems. They're always, I told you there's only two kinds of people on this earth. Currently, those who believe in Jesus Christ and those who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, now hang on. So God sends those non-believers, not a delusion, a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. This isn't just a few people. This is 80% of the earth is under a powerful delusion of God for not believing. But why? Here's the last reason God gives. They have delighted in wickedness. They delight in wickedness. They love pornography. They're not trying to quit pornography. When they look at pornography, it doesn't bother them or convict them at all. They enjoy pornography. They enjoy getting drunk. They enjoy going to orgies. They enjoy getting, um, you know, you invite them to dinner and they enjoy, you know, trying to sleep with your wife, trying to snuggle up to your wife. I, I wouldn't bring these people anywhere near my my life, my house. I wouldn't give them a ride to the store and, and my car. <laughs> no. Why would you want to be driving around trying to help someone who's under God's powerful delusion because they delight in wickedness. That's all I'm going to say about it. You go over it in your Bible and think about, wow, I never even knew that about God. And why does God do that? God can do anything he wants. That's why he's God. It's not for us to question why. God, you know, How much of God do you think you've been revealed so far? How much of God do you think you know about? 80%? 50%? No, less than 1% of God do you know about. We only see a shadow of things now, but it's more than enough to what? To believe. It's more than enough to believe and so receive eternal life. What God has given us so far is, does not fall short. We are not given less. We are giving just the perfect amount. However, when you're in heaven and you see God as he is, you will know everything about everything about everything. Okay. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because God shows you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and through belief in the truth. You know, he's talking to those first generation Christians. But look what they do. They're being sanctified in the works they do for God and also by believing in the truth. That is why God loves them. He called you to do this through our gospel. Today, that's the Holy Bible. That you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say this. You know that um, Jesus has been glorified. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. It doesn't say that one day you can enjoy the glory of God our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, no. It says you're going to share. You're going to share in his glory because God cannot run out of glory. God cannot run out of anything. He doesn't mind giving you some of his glory. You're going to share in this glory when it says we will be revealed and made like him in heaven with our new eternal bodies. You're going to share. You're going to have a piece of his glory Ooh you're going to have a, I'm getting excited. I'm not kidding. You're going to have a piece of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. You're going to have a piece of his glory living inside of you. 
And, and you want a truck payment today. <laughs> kind of makes you seem foolish. You want a big old house payment. Could you imagine being alive on earth, walking around with a piece of God's glory in you, shining out and everything? And I mean, news channels would follow you around everywhere you went, you know, things would be melting in front of you because of the perfection of this holy glory. The government would probably try to capture you and put you underground. So, you know, I'm telling you, in heaven, you're going to share in his glory. You're going to get your share of that glory. And that is what it means when they say the crowns, your share, your crowns, the good works you've done after you were saved. First, you believed but because you believed, you started to do good works on the behalf of Jesus Christ. That is what you're going to be rewarded for. Oh, it just sounds incredibly awesome. I lost my place. Hang on. Okay, we only have two or three lines left. So then, brothers and sisters... Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you. Now look, stand firm and hold on to the teachings. Well, what was the first thing we started to show in this chapter was they started to attack the teachings. They started to say they were false. The enemy was saying, don't listen to Paul. Don't listen to Jesus Christ. whether by word or mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, comma. See, these, Paul is the king of long sentences. Encourage, ye, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. So what is God doing for the believers today if you're following him? That's why I said a lot of believers are mostly asleep. Do you see your fellow believers enjoying all the benefits? When I teach this Bible, we just keep going over one benefit, one benefit. The benefits never stop coming. They just keep piling up. Do you see any um, Christians around you enjoying all these benefits every single day? No, you don't because they're asleep with the remote control in one hand and a big old bag of cheddar cheese popcorn in the other hand. They have fallen asleep in the Lord. Now, I don't personally believe the Lord will send them a delusion because they're already believers, but they're, like I said, they got one foot on the narrow road, the narrow path to life, and they got the whole rest of their body on the wide road to destruction. You know, Jesus says, you are lukewarm. You're on a, like a fence. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot or cold so I could do something with you. But you are lukewarm and I vomit you out of my mouth. I spew you out of my mouth. Because most Christians are believers. Now, this is going to shock you also. You're going to go to heaven and there's going to be a lot of people who... I would say um, half the Christians in our society today might receive one crown. Now, I don't want to get into this because I don't 100% know this. It doesn't say this in the Bible. But, yes, they will be in heaven. They will receive eternity in paradise. They will never have any problems. They will always be full of joy. Yes, yes. They will receive everything you could receive just walking around in heaven. And God will love them forever. However, because they fell asleep after becoming a believer, they're not going to receive many crowns, rewards. And those things have, well, there's a reason God brought them up. There's a reason God said, I'm going to reward each one according to what you have done. Okay. I'm going to reward each one of you according to what you have done after you became a believer. So if someone be so I want you to um judge for yourself 
how much is a person like this going to receive if they believed, went for a little while, like six months, and then they fell asleep in the Lord and went back to the things of the world? Like when Peter, he was so troubled after he denied Christ three times, he went back to fishing. He went and got his boat back and started fishing again, and Jesus had to come down on the bank and appear to them and, and reinstate Peter and say, you have to get going. There was a very short time that Peter fell asleep after Jesus was gone, before he was reawakened, reinstated. Well, so how many crowns would you give a believer? Let's say, let's pretend for a minute you are God, you're passing out the crowns in heaven. And the believer is a believer. They became a full believer, but then for 35, 40 years, they fell asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ. How many crowns would you give a person like that? You see, you get the point. They're not going to receive as much as someone who's spent their whole entire life working on behalf of Jesus Christ. That's not my words. That's God's words. It's, it's not like a grade school today where, okay, we're going to have a race, but there's no winners. There's no losers. You're just going to do the best you can. And we're going to run around the track three times. And then, okay, we had a race. Well, why even call it a race? Because the definition of race means to try to run faster than the other kids. Try to be the best you can. Paul said, I strive to be the best. I, I run, he runs his spiritual Christian race to win the race, he said. He wants first prize. It's right in the Bible. Paul said, I want first prize. I want to run my race to win. So you got grade schools today and middle schools going, oh, well, you did a good job. There was 23 kids. Everybody gets a blue ribbon. Because if we change the color of the ribbon, then some kid might be offended. Well, then how do the children learn to strive for more? You want the one kid to, you know, even at a farm auction or a, a fair, you know, a county fair, you got a hog. Some hogs are better than other hogs because the kid did all the work in the 4-H club, and that hog gets the blue ribbon. And then the next hog gets like a yellow ribbon. And the hog that got the blue ribbon then is auctioned off at a much higher, more valuable price. Some of these kids, they'll raise a cow. They get the blue ribbon out of cow. You know, that cow would normally be worth a couple thousand, three thousand dollars. But because it's a blue ribbon cow, some rich guy will pay $10,000, $15,000 at the auction for the cow, and the kid can go to college for two years on that money, the farm college. So that's what I'm saying. In heaven, there are going to be different winners, and there's going to be people that are lesser winners that receive less crowns. So one reason is Christianity is not something that you're supposed to just like been there, done that. Christianity is a daily event that if you want the benefits, you got to get up and talk to Jesus every day. And you notice I never, ever tell you what to do personally. I never, ever tell another Christian what to do. I never give advice on what other Christians should do. I never would, and I never will. I never have. People say, well, what should I do, Dave? I say, go ask Jesus Christ. They go, oh. Well, I don't want to ask Jesus. I want to ask you, Dave. Nope, not my problem. This is between you and Jesus, because when I get to heaven, I'm not going to be in charge. I'm not going to be passing out the crowns. You don't want the things I'm capable of giving you because I'm not capable of giving you anything. 
You want the things that Jesus is capable of giving you. And boy, will that be a glorious day. I'll read the last line again. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his great grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. This all one line. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. That's the end of chapter 2. It was a very powerful chapter.